How long do you know dermatologists from Lithuania? Well, 20 years. Since 20 years, maybe longer, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, um, it was Professor Lapinskaite I met first. And we met at the European Dermatology Forum. This is a small group of maybe 150 dermatologists from all Europe. And so we try to have someone from each country. And then, of course, I met Professor Bileite. And this is my first time at a dermatology meeting here. I had been at an allergy meeting <laughs> in Palanga many years ago, but this was not dermatology. Is it a big difference happened in Lithuania dermatology after 20 years? Of course, there is a big difference. So, um, you can see on the streets, but also in the science, I think, as major development. So, um, not only the cars are better on the streets, but also the medicine. <laughs> I'm quite sure no one can notice them. The science which is presented here is very good from Vilnius University, from Kaunas, top level, it's good. Why you decided to choose that topic, eczema? Well, this was maybe serendipity or chance or... When I was a young dermatologist, I had started as immunologist in the lab. And then went to allergy and then I decided for dermatology. And somehow I fell over atopic dermatitis. And since then, I couldn't stop because this disease I call it, it's like a bull in Spain where I'm the torero. <laughs> I try to, to handle it because it's such a problem. The people are suffering and especially so many children are suffering. And so, and so many things are not done correctly. And so I started and it is my major field of interest over maybe 30, 40 years almost. And I don't regret <laughs> because there is development and I think it's a very exciting time now. What do you think about the new treatment and medications? What's changing? First of all, we are about to better understand the mechanisms. Before you can come to a new therapy, you have to understand the disease and over the last century, so to say, there were different concepts. Some said it's only dry skin, some said it's only the nerves, some said it's only allergy. So, and each one was narrow-minded following. And now through modern molecular genetics, we have detected, and this is not trivial, in large studies, with 50,000 and 100,000 patients being studied, we have detected several genes which predispose. When you have this gene, you have a much higher risk to get atopic eczema. And from these genes, we learn about the mechanism. So one of these genes is filagrin, is in the upper skin, epidermis, and it makes the barrier disturbed. So more goes out and more goes in than normal. So it's not so tight anymore. And this is a problem because allergens, other noxious, harmful substances can penetrate easier if you have this gene. And then one has found genes for the immune response, showing that there is an abnormal immune response and a we call it deviated, a shift towards not so protective but harmful immunity. And from this we learn that we have to do something for the barrier and we have to do something to find uh, relevant allergens because it is true some allergens can elicit eczema. 
and therefore we have to test and have to find out individually. And this is, it's like an art, <laughs> because you should not uh, um, forbid everything. You know, there are some people who say, diet, don't eat, one, two, three, four, five, this is bad. We have individualized approach. Only these substances who make your skin worse, they you should avoid. And this is much less than, for instance, what is positive in an allergy test. This is the art of interpretation, where there are many mistakes are made all over the world. And the third is the nerves. They play a role. Psychology, it's not a disease, but just a normal human being. When you have emotions or stress, this is influencing your skin. And especially in eczema, they are very sensitive. So this has to be taken into account. And we teach the patients, we call it patient education or eczema school, how to cope with stress, how to do relaxation. So not only how to cream and how to maybe cook a cake without eggs, um, but also to take care of your psychological well-being. This is a whole package and we call it patient management, much more than prescribe a drug. And with this, I think um, patients have a much higher quality of life, but still it's not solved. I want to be much better and therefore we are happy that on the horizon, not yet available, but maybe next year in America and maybe in two years or three years in Europe, there will be new drugs and I think they are very exciting. Biologics. Talking about the stress, how can we reduce the damage to our skin? I tell my patients, you cannot reduce the stress and you cannot change the other people, your boss or your partner. You only can change yourself and your reaction too. And watch yourself. What happened the day before you got a new attack of itch? And when you realize that this was a quarrel with somebody, you think, this stupid guy or girl is not worth it that I ruin my skin. So this is very um, lay-like, uh, not very professional set. But whenever people realize that this and this situation makes the skin worse, it's the beginning that it doesn't do it anymore, you know? So it's, it's not so difficult as it sounds. It needs honesty. People are not honest to themselves. They, they say, I have no problem. <laughs> when somebody comes and says, I have no stress, I say, come on. This is, <laughs> this is a sure sign that you have a lot of stress. <laughs> and stress itself is not bad. There's good stress and bad stress. No, I, I don't want to to put it all in the psychological corner. But it is one part. And if I only concentrate on the skin and the inflammation and don't take this into account, I miss something. Many patients, when they hear the diagnosis of atopic eczema, react tragically. What did you suggest to them? I have patients who wanted to commit suicide, not because of the diagnosis, but because of the itch. The diagnosis, they don't like the diagnosis, and I tell them, listen, in Germany, and I think in Lithuania too, one out of five children have this disease, 20%. So you are not alone. And there is a big, big spectrum, very large, uh, variety, very mild and very severe. And don't look at the internet and just look at the very severe. So the chances that you have it mild and that you get rid of it are very high. 
So I try to not say this is incurable and you will have it until the rest of your life. This is stupid because I have so many patients who lost it. They had it very severe when they were 14, 15, 16 and now it's 30, they don't have it anymore. So I know that you can grow out of it. And so I have to tell this my patients that there is hope, it's not forever. And uh, I'm fighting against the term incurable. Some of my colleagues use it and I, I think they just want to have an excuse to get rid of a uh, frustrated patient who may be critical and may ask doctor, why am I not better? It's incurable, come on. I don't like this, you know. So, how to prevent this disease? And we have to distinguish primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. Sorry, this is a bit scholar-like, but primary prevention means after birth do something that the disease does not start. Secondary prevention means you have a risk group and you concentrate on the risk group and do something. And tertiary prevention means that you have a disease and you treat it and you do something that it does not uh, exacerbate, relapse again. You, I think, want primary prevention. And let's start with primary prevention. Until recently, we recommended avoidance. So, actively breastfeeding, the first three or four months, breastfeeding is good, this is still okay. And then we said, slow introduction of foods and avoidance of egg and fish and nuts and um, avoidance of pets and dogs and cats and things like that. And now came the study, the famous peanut study from an English pediatrician, Gideon Leck. He found that in Tel Aviv, he is from Israel, so in Tel Aviv they don't have peanut allergy the kids, but in London, the same Jewish kids in London have peanut allergy. And so he looked and in Tel Aviv they all have a kind of sweet round lollipop there and this is peanut. All the kids in Tel Aviv, but not the kids in London. And so he thought maybe there is a way to induce oral tolerance. And he did a big study over many years. We were all waiting when come the results. LEAP study, L-E-A-P, and it was published last year. And to make a long story short, the group who was actively fed peanuts, some, I think, five milligrams or some, every day they eat peanuts. And the other group, total avoidance. And the group who was actively fed had significantly less peanut allergy than the avoidance. So it changes our paradigm. No longer avoidance, but rather active introduction of tolerance. And we know that diversity, so different foods, is better than one food. And also dogs may be preventive even, not cats. There's a problem, the cat allergen is so potent and we do not know the dose response curve. So we cannot really recommend, maybe somebody would have to keep five cats, but in how big an apartment, so to get tolerant. And the other one, only one and a half cat. So you understand what I mean with cats? It's too risky, we, we still say avoid cat. But you can have a dog, you can eat peanut, you can eat egg. So this is a primary prevention. And um, the secondary is of course then when I know I'm sensitized against something that I, then I have to avoid. And the proactive, I told you this would be the tertiary prevention that I say try to have the interval as long as possible.